Hello everyone, welcome to the Global Mapper webinar for the month of December. My name is Taya Youngs, Application Specialist here at Global Blue Marble Geographics. With me today is David McKittrick. December indeed. December means it's almost the end of 2014, almost 2015. Who would have believed it? Um, thank you all for uh, signing up today. Thank you for attending our, the latest in the Global Mapper webinar series. As you're seeing on the slide in front of you, today's webinar is going to be looking at LiDAR, LiDAR processing in Global Mapper specifically. Um, as those of you who follow the development cycle of Global Mapper will be aware, we've put a lot of work into enhancing some of the LiDAR uh, processing capabilities. Um, and it's been a while since we've actually talked about LiDAR in a formal way like this. So we figured this month um, we'd set aside the webinar to talk about the entire process of working with LiDAR and Global Mapper from importing, um, doing some cropping, filtering perhaps, some QA of your data, and ultimately generating some uh, files, maybe um, um, uh, terrain files, or uh, even going as far as generating contour files. I'm not sure if we'll have a chance to do that today given our time, but we'll we'll talk about the entire process of working with LiDAR from importing LiDAR to uh, generating data and hopefully eventually uh, at the end of our session to exporting uh, LiDAR, uh, the LiDAR as well. This session is being recorded and will be available on our website within a couple of days. Before we begin, there are a few housekeeping issues to cover. The webinar is in listen-only mode, so in other words, you can hear us, but we can't hear you. If you want to submit a question about today's topic, you can use the questions tool on the GoToWebinar panel to the right of your screen. Blue Marble product specialists will try to answer your question in written form as they're submitted, and will also answer some questions verbally as we can fit, squeeze in in our time limits. Yeah, and we anticipate there might be quite a few questions today. We've got a very large audience in today's webinar. Um, I do make one request, and we try to, uh, that is to try to keep those questions relevant to what we're talking about. Um, as uh, Tam mentioned, we have some product specialists sitting on the sideline e eagerly waiting for your questions. So, um, and Taya will be monitoring those questions as they come in as well. Um, based on our time and based on availability, we'll actually fire some of those questions out and we'll attempt to answer those questions verbally as they come in. So um, the uh, question and answer session will be active during the, the uh, presentation. As you'll see on the slide in front of you, we also have a, an email inbox. Those of you who have attended previous webinars uh, will be familiar with this email address. This is our inbox for help um, as far as Global Mapper is concerned. Any questions you have, that perhaps you're watching the recording of this, if you have questions about any of the content, or about Global Mapper in general, feel free to use that inbox. We monitor that inbox um, on a continual basis and try to respond as quickly as we can. Um, we also have the forum. I don't have information about the forum on this slide, but at the end of today's presentation, um, I'll uh, show you the URL for the forum. You can even get to the, U the uh, forum from the help menu within the application. Forum is an excellent resource as well for finding out about um, the application, and specifically today for finding out about some of the uh, LiDAR processing functions. So with that, let's take a look at specifically what we're going to be covering today. Uh, as I mentioned, today's topic is LiDAR, so we're going to begin today by answering the question or by asking the question, what is LiDAR? We're going to introduce the uh, the technology of LiDAR. I'm not going to go into too much depth as far as that's concerned, but there may be some of you attending today who are not familiar with this technology. It's very much an emerging technology, so those of you who are fairly new will go over some of the basics. Um, we will introduce the LiDAR module in Global Mapper. Those of you who have not, have not seen the module, or maybe you're not aware of the module, we'll talk about uh, the functionality that that brings to play uh, in regard specifically to working with these point cloud data sets. And if you don't currently use the LiDAR module, I'll also show you how you can activate that in your setup and uh, try it out with a trial option. You can try the LiDAR module, or if you're interested in activating it permanently, how you can register it and make it part of your Global Mapper setup. When we get into actually looking at the application, we're going to talk about some of the filtering and cropping options you have. You know, if you're working with a raw point cloud, you may need to pare it down to perhaps a geographical area or limit the, geogra limit the elevation extent of some of the points in your point cloud or just simply um, uh, create, create, uh, import just a sample perhaps, just maybe a, a preview just a, a, a small subset of your data. And we'll talk about some of those options. Um, when we have our point cloud uh, imported into the application, we'll talk about some of the visualization options. Um, we can render your point cloud based on various characteristics that are, are inherently associated with each point, things like intensity or uh, classification. And we'll go, obviously go into more detail when we actually look at the, uh, those components of the software. We'll also talk a little bit about rendering your point cloud in, in 3D. Uh, as a 3D model, and also generating a profile, a cross-sectional profile, another way of uh, visualizing your data. So a lot of things to cover, um, covering the basic uh, visualization options. 
some of the new tools we've introduced with the release of version 16 of Global Mapper include tools for automatically detecting certain types of points within a point cloud. Um, we're going to look at some of those. Specifically, we're going to look at ways in which you can uh, automatically identify points that are likely to be ground points. Very useful if you're obviously you're doing terrain modeling. And also we'll look at um, uh, examples of um, point clouds where we can identify buildings and identify vegetations and apply the appropriate classification to those. So very, very powerful functionality that has just recently been introduced and hopefully we'll give you uh, some information on that. Uh, that'll be towards the end of today's session. Um, related to that previous function where we identify vegetation and buildings, we'll also show you a tool that will physically extract those in vector format, allow you to delineate the outline of a building and generate a three-dimensional vector feature uh, and allow you to model that building in a three-dimensional environment as well. I should mention that this process is on, this development process is ongoing and the extracting of vector features is something that we're looking at expanding significantly throughout the life history of uh, version 16 and indeed going into version 17 of Global Mapper, you'll see some major enhancements as far as that capability is concerned. Um, obviously, many users of LiDAR data are using it as a means to an end rather than an end in and of itself. So um, one of those, well, perhaps the most common use of uh, using LiDAR is for terrain modeling, generating a surface model of the ground, basically. And we'll talk about that. It's something that's obviously not new to Global Mapper. We've had these, this function for many, many years. But I'll, in the context of looking at LiDAR, we'll talk about generating a surface model from our LiDAR point cloud. And no process in Global Mapper will be complete without addressing the process of exporting data. Um, LiDAR data sets can be imported, obviously. We're going to talk about that at the start, but they can also be exported. So whatever processing you do, whatever reclassification, filtering, or whatever analysis you've derived from your point cloud or whatever information you've associated with your point cloud, ultimately you can export that again, perhaps making it available in another platform, perhaps making it uh, a, a, a file that you deliver to a client. So importing and exporting are two bookends. Um, in the middle, obviously, we'll do a lot of the processing work as well. So that is the plan of attack for today, and obviously we have a lot to cover, so we're going to go ahead and start by asking, or answering, I should say, that question. We'll start by asking, and then we'll answer. Uh, what is LiDAR? And Taya, do you know what LiDAR is? Have you had any experience working with LiDAR? Um, it's a very long acronym as far as I know. I think it's light detection something. Well, you know, there's a little bit of discussion about that. There is some, I guess, con controversy as to what the, uh, the uh, terms actually stand for, and that's actually my fir first bullet. Um, I was under the impression until fairly recently that uh, LiDAR was a, an abbreviated uh, form of light detection and ranging. Well, some sources that I encountered recently uh, argued the point that is actually a combination of the words light and radar. I don't think we should quibble over the definition. I don't think it changes the basic uh, function of the, uh, of the data format. But it is a, a format that's been around for many decades, basically. As you will see, it's a laser-derived uh, uh, point data set, um, uh, typically airborne. I'm going to bring up my bullets as I, as I talk about them. Typically airborne collected. Increasingly, we're finding a lot of these data sets are actually collected on the ground. Terrestrial models uh, derived from LiDAR are becoming increasingly common, increasingly available. In fact, a few weeks ago, right outside our building here in Hallowell, we had a, a group of technicians actually collecting local LiDAR data from the ground on the ground. So we're very eagerly looking forward to actually getting our hands on some of that data so we can see our own building here as a, a three-dimensional point cloud. So it's a la laser-based system, laser-based remote technology system that's typically airborne. Most of the data we're going to be working with today has been collected from an airborne platform, typically a fixed-wing aircraft flying over an area, transmitting a laser pulse, or obviously a series of laser pulses, and determining what the nature of that surface is that that, that, laser, that laser pulse uh, reflects off. Reflected laser pulses are used to calculate distance, ultimately, and this obviously depends on some very precise calibrated instrumentation on the aircraft that is able to calculate that precise distance and indeed the elevation of the aircraft. So based on those variables, um, LIDAR ultimately comes up with a series of X, Y, and Z, or X, Y, and Z points um, that position each point uh, in, a, in a space, a three-dimensional space. Um, uh, points are obviously uh, only relevant if they're uh, processed uh, as a collect in a collective form. A single point obviously isn't that much of much value. Uh, LiDAR, you will find as we get into looking at some samples, um, typically is comprised of very closely spaced points, and the volume of points covering a certain area can get up into the millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions, and sometimes even billions of points. Obviously, the 
higher the number of points, the closer the spacing of those points, the more precise the modeling process will be. But when it comes down to the very basics, it's a very simple to understand format. It's simply X, Y, and Z value associated with a point. Now, additional information may be associated with a point, and we'll see that when we get into looking at Global Mapper as well, where each point may and typically does have a classification. In other words, the nature of the surface uh, that was, uh, uh, first of all, uh, detected by the laser, in other words, reflected from that laser pulse, uh, can be determined. The intensity of the return will be a reflection on the on the type of surface. And return number, um, a given laser pulse may be returned several times if it's able to penetrate through one surface and hit another surface. And that would typically be a leaf, uh, where a, a leaf obviously is a lot, will allow a certain amount of penetration of that laser, uh, transmitted laser pulse. Um, so we'll get multiple returns. And again, we'll see that when we actually look at a point cloud. Um, LiDAR is the raw material for many 3D analysis processes. Um, it's typically not an end in and of itself, although we're increasingly find a lot of people see the LiDAR mod model itself as being um, a viable way of representing features, uh, three-dimensional features. But it's more typical that people are using LiDAR as a means, as I mentioned before, to perhaps to create a terrain surface. And from that terrain surface modeling process, perhaps to generate contours, do some volume calculation, perhaps even do run one of the analysis, for instance, watershed analysis or viewshed analysis. So LiDAR is certainly a very important uh, stepping stone into getting into those analysis tools. Um, and uh, we will, as I said, be covering uh, some of those as we go through today. So with that, let's take a look at the application itself. Now, as you can see, I've got several windows open here. Um, first one I'm going to bring up is actually a blank Global Mapper window. Um, and I want to point out before we actually start looking at any LiDAR point clouds, I want to point out the LiDAR module. Right here in my toolbar, I'm just dragging down the module uh, toolbar. This is what you'll see if you activate the module is this new toolbar. And to make it a little more clear and a little more visible, I'll drag it down into a um, introductory screen here. Um, this uh, toolbar provides many advanced functions that you can use to process your LiDAR data. And we will get into looking at many of these throughout the course of, of today's presentation. Uh, for instance, we can change the visualization based on whatever characteristic that we want to focus on. I, I mentioned before things like intensity or classification, and we'll, we'll look at those in just a little bit. So this toolbar gives you a very quick and easy way to change how the LiDAR point cloud is being represented on your screen, what data, what component of the data is actually being reflected in your point cloud. Um, well, other buttons allow you to automate, or to simplify, I should say, the classification. Um, so if we want to select a group of points or select you know, uh, you know, a collection of points within an area and render them as a particular class, we've got some very easy buttons for doing that right here in the module toolbar. We then have a number of very powerful functions, as I mentioned during my introduction, for doing things like auto-classifying ground points, auto-classifying non-ground points, specifically there's going to be buildings and trees, for feature extraction, in other words, for actually vectorizing um, features based on those points. Uh, building footprints, for instance, can be vectorized as three-dimensional models. We have filtering tools. We have a tool for filtering your point cloud. And we have a tool for our applying colors. We'll get into looking at these a little bit later. So the, this toolbar will not be available out of the box in the standard version of Global Mapper, but it's certainly something that you can activate. From the Help menu, if we go to the Module Extensions, Extension License Manager, um, you will see on the left-hand side our built-in modules list. And your setup will include the LiDAR module. If you have not activated it, the checkbox will not be there. Obviously, I have. But if you want to activate the LiDAR module, simply check the box. It will prompt you with a registration screen. And as with any of the registration options uh, in Global Mapper, you can either uh, enter an order number, um, a point to a license file if, you, if you've been provided with one, or if you have not actually purchased the module, you can enter, uh, you can request rather a seven day trial. And it will activate all of the functionality I'm going to show today for that limited duration allowing you to, to test it out. Obviously, if at some stage you want to purchase the, the uh, LiDAR module on a permanent basis, again, it's simply a case of going into that uh, dialog box, that registration dialog box um, right here. It's a grayed out box in my case. Register the module and it will be active uh, for the duration of, uh, or for, for uh, permanently, It'll, for the duration of follow, as long as you use the software. So again, LiDAR module uh, is going to be used today during some of our scenarios. It is not required for using LiDAR data. You can uh, perform certain basic processes within Global Mapper without the LiDAR module. Uh, importing, a little bit of filtering, generating terrain surfaces, you can do that. Uh, within Global Mapper without activating the module. Um, hopefully you'll see today that activation of that module provides a lot more advanced functionality. 
Um, so I want to try to make sure that as we go through certain scenarios today, we address those components that uh, uh, require the module and those components that are available without the use of the module. The first thing that we're going to do, the simple act of importing a point cloud, does not require the module. I'm just going to pull this up out of the way just a little bit towards the top of my window here. I'm going to go through a simple import process to bring in a sample point cloud. Um, as with every uh, file format in Global Mapper, the way to get data in is very simple. Obviously, the file menu, open data file. There's a folder button in my toolbar that will do the same thing. Right here in the middle of the introductory screen is our open data files button. Again, same end result. You're going to get the standard import dialog box. Now, Global Mapper supports many different point cloud formats or different uh, data sets that may include uh, point X, Y, and Z data or X, Y, and Z data. The common ones in, in, uh, when using LiDAR are .las and .laz or .laz files. This is a compressed LiDAR file. I'm just going to point to this file as an example. And we're going to go ahead and bring that in. Now, you'll notice there's no, no uh, specific entry point for LiDAR files. It comes in the same front door as every other format that's uh, within the data. So you don't have to predefine the feature, the file type before you import. It's just a standard import function. What is different about LiDAR is the dialog box that will appear after you initiate the import. Because within this dialog box, you can perform certain filters, um, certain uh, you know, apply certain constraints to the data based on what you know about your point cloud. Now, before I get into showing you some of the examples of what we have here, let me stress that in a typical situation, you'll probably not want to filter your LiDAR point cloud during import. We can obviously do that um, after it's been imported, but during import, I would typically say that most people um, uh, would not know enough about the data to make those decisions. In other words, do you know that your data specifically has different types of classes? Do you know that information enough to be able to make the decision to filter out what you don't need at this stage? I would suggest, especially if you're working with data you've never seen before, go ahead and import everything. Um, but you do have options uh, during this import if you need or if you want to pre-filter that data. Uh, filtering can be done based on class. You'll notice a lot of these classes fairly self-explanatory. Unclassified is something we want to address uh, at length when we're actually looking at some of our data. Ground points, pr probably the most common classification that people are interested in. And then we have others, vegetation, building, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And this list goes on and on and on. It's a very long list. Now, the availability of these classes in your data set is obviously going to reflect um, um, where, where your data's come from or who has processed your data. Um, but um, uh, you will find that most data will have at least a certain number of these classes pre-assigned. If it doesn't, don't worry. We're going to address that towards the end. If your data is entirely unclassified, you don't know, it can't distinguish a building from a tree, from the ground, we'll address that a little bit later. We can also filter by return type. Uh, return types reflect the number of uh, tr uh, reflected signals for every laser pulse. Uh, if there's more than one, you can filter those out as necessary. Um, we can also filter geographically based on whatever bounds we specify. And this bounding box is the same bounding box that you'll see in many different components of Global Mapper, but allowing you to filter, again, based on whatever geographic constraints, probably the most common of which would be to crop to a selected area. Perhaps this is going to reflect a jurisdictional boundary. And obviously, you can uh, limit just the point cloud rendering to what falls within that boundary, if that's what's uh, relevant to you. Um, we can also preview to create a subset of our data, delete uh, files that are uh, delete points. I'm sorry that are over a certain number of standard deviations, and you can specify that number. This will allow you to remove those obviously erroneous points that are going to really uh, uh, extend the uh, elevation extent, but are obviously completely incorrect. So you can filter it down to a known uh, range if you like. Um, if you have um, uh, data, uh, LiDAR data that reflects depth, in other words, bathymetric LiDAR data, which is becoming increasingly common, the, the values themselves may be positive. Global Mapper will see those as positive and assume that they're above the surface, but you can treat those as negatives by simply checking this box. So those increased values will be depths rather than heights in that case. So again, just on some of these filtering options we have available during import, um, another option you'll see is to go ahead and immediately create an elevation grid. Um, bypassing the rendering of the point cloud, uh, um, create a terrain surface or a, a raster surface model. Again, on a typical scenario, I would not suggest or not recommend doing this. Um, I would suggest you actually look at the point cloud first before you actually import the data. But it is an option uh, during that import process, and the elevation grid options here would reflect that selection. So in our case, we're just simply going to import our point cloud. And this example is a relatively small area. It's just up the road from where we're sitting today um, in Augusta, uh, about 
three or four miles, three or four miles off the road. Um, this very distinct structure you see in the middle is actually our state capital. We may have shown you this in previous webinars, and we're going to be looking a little bit at this point cloud and some of the, the uh, information that could be derived from this point cloud today. Is there a size limit for files that can be brought in to Global Mapper for LiDAR? That's a very good question, and one that we do get a lot. Uh, yeah, that's that's. I'm not surprised that one came in early. You'll notice this point cloud, by the way, is 870. Uh, just over 870,000 points. We're going to look in, look in a little more detail at some of the information that we know about this point cloud, but off the bat we can see it's under a million points. This is actually a very small point cloud, and we use this small one obviously because we want to uh, you know, see some of the processes working very quickly. Um, we have uh, experimented and worked with point cloud data up to a billion and actually over a billion points. Um, this is a, a very much a moving target. We're encountering uh, users who are uh, wanting to process 5 billion, 10 billion points at a time. Global Mapper has no physical constraint, but when you get into point clouds of that size, you're going to find that it's a hardware issue rather than uh, the, the capability of software. But there is no defined upper limit in terms of the number of points that Global Mapper can process. So, And it is something where, in terms of the processing speed, obviously the larger the files and more intensive the processing requirements, we are making sure we work on that and making sure Global Mapper is optimized for working with those large point clouds. So that was just a simple import process, very straightforward. Um, I should also address very quickly, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but we, we, we kind of make the assumption that you have access to data. You know, I obviously have a sample file here. I was able to import it. But very often the question that pre precedes this is, where do I get LiDAR? Um, we've actually had that question come in quite a lot even recently. Uh, working in a particular area, we've introduced the idea of working with point clouds. But uh, you know, if there's nothing available in your area, obviously you don't have access to the tools. So the question comes up, where do I get LiDAR? Well, obviously there may be data available local to you. Um, certain states have archives of data that you can actually download directly. Um, also, it's worth considering or worth noting that in, Blue, in uh, Global Mapper's online data list, um, where we essentially stream data, um, you may have used this for streaming imagery, for instance, but there is a LiDAR section in here. Now, this LiDAR section provides a number of links. I should stress that these are not streaming services per se. Um, we've got a NOAA link here. We've got the USGS link, which is a very useful one. We've also got our Open Topography LiDAR Portal site, which is a great source that uh, is a collaborative effort to pull together data from multiple sources. These actually are not streaming services, but rather what will happen if I select this is I will open up a web browser, uh, go to that site, and explore what data sets may be available. Um, so there are some links in here that will provide at least a starting point for trying to find some data for an area that you, you're working in. A, a good source as well, again, is calling your local GIS office and asking the question. They may, they may know of a collection process that's going on and may be able to direct you to uh, a good source. So, But I uh, just want to address the fact that uh, we do have some links in there uh, in regard to uh, accessing LiDAR. Now, importing our point cloud, very simple process. I'm going to talk about visualization in just one minute. I also want to very quickly bring up another possible source for LiDAR. And this is being a little creative in our, our processing here. I'm going to use the standard control U to remove that file I just imported. I'm going to initiate another open. And this time I'm going to point to a text file. This is a simple XYZ text file. I'm not going to take the time to preview it. Take my word for it. It's X, Ys, and Zs in a simple comma delimited format. And when I click open on this, this is going to bring up our standard ASCII import dialog box. This is how you'll typically import text for creating point array or creating lines or even creating areas uh, from those points. Um, one of the options that you'll notice here is to automatically take those points and generate a point cloud. Um, so as well as defining the characteristics of the file itself, you can have Global Mapper believe that it's actually a LiDAR file. Now that will allow you to process it in the same way you would process the standard LiDAR data that we're going to be working with today. So your source data when working with LiDAR may simply be an X, Y, and, uh, and Z file. I'm not actually going to bring this in, but it is an option that you know if you have Again, very simple XYZ files. You can use this ASCII import, and by checking this option in the import box, um, you can uh, fake Global Mapper into believing it's actually a LiDAR point cloud. So let's go ahead and open up a workspace. Now, this workspace has got the same data that we looked at just a minute ago, except in this case, I've actually brought in another layer. You'll see I have some underlying imagery as well. We're going to bring that into play in just a little bit. We've got some tiles of ortho imagery. Um, what I want to talk about now is point cloud visualization. This was one of the bullets in my uh, my introduction. 
Um, the initial display of your point cloud, it's a fairly unique format in this regard. It is a vector format, um, but the initial display of your point cloud reflects the inherent elevation value that's associated with each point. If I quickly choose my feature info button and I select a point at random, I just bring up the standard feature info dialog box, let me adjust its size so we can see a little more clearly, you'll see for that specific point, you'll see a number of variables that have been associated. The elevation right down to centimeter level. This is a meter value, so 0.41 meters, obviously down to the centimeter level in terms of precision. Um, we also have intensity, we have scan angle, we have classification. What is that point? Well, in that case, that point is unclassified. And a number of other pieces of information are also available there. Um, the initial display by default of the data reflects this elevation variable and the display actually the uh, actual color is associated with whatever the current shader uh, that has been selected in, in my elevation uh, drop down list here if i wanted to change that to for instance global shader you'll see that will automatically be reflected as well this is a different shader pattern obviously within the context of this area there's not a lot of elevation range so i'm just seeing basically one color so whatever shader pattern has been selected here will be reflected by default in terms of the display. And it is dynamic, it can be changed. You can apply your own custom shader if necessary. In other words, you can build a shader pattern that reflects colors that you want to apply to certain elevation ranges. That's an option that's available in the configuration dialog box if you want to perform that one. Now, as I mentioned previously, there are options in this drop-down list that will change the visualization from elevation to some other variable, um, intensity. Now, intensity is an interesting one. I'm actually going to zoom in just a little closer here because intensity, um, depending on the zoom level, I think this is probably a good zoom level to look at this, actually looks like a, a black and white photograph. The darker colors are, in this case, are reflecting vegetation. The lighter colors, grounds. And you can see it almost looks like a, a, an image, if you like. It is derived from closely spaced points, but it looks like a black and white image. And one of the options we've just introduced with the LiDAR module is actually to create a, a surface based on this intensity value. Rather than simply basing it on elevation, you can base it on intensity value. So again, just another visualization option. I'll point to a couple more. I'm going to take the time to go through each one of these. Um, um, return, uh, the, the return number um, is going to reflect in a color pattern the return, uh, the, which, how many returns were uh, generated from one laser pulse. In this case, the blue indicates that there was one return, or either that or it was the first return. The red indicates second return, and if we get in closer, you'll see some other colors starting to appear here. You'll see yellows as well. So this color pattern is a great indication of where there's likely to be vegetation because vegetation typically is going to correlate with where there's multiple returns from one pulse. Obviously if a pulse hits a solid surface it's likely it's only going to have one return. If it hits a a, uh, a vegetative surface, a leaf for instance, it's likely it may penetrate and that's what we're seeing here in this in this color pattern. You may also notice at the top of this list we have color by RGB elevation and that's actually where we started. Um, the default appearance, if we choose this option, is to have the actual colors of the points themselves reflected. Well, obviously, in this case, our point cloud doesn't have any RGB values. We don't have any colors associated with these points. But one of the things we can do with the Global Mapper module, um, which is the final button over here in the toolbar, is actually apply a color from whatever raster layer you happen to have displayed, which in my case is this ortho photo, we can actually apply the color of the pixel underneath each point to that particular point. And it's simply clicking the button that does that. It's going to go through each of the 870,000 points. And initially it appears that the point cloud has disappeared, but it actually is now rendered with the colors that are associated with that image. And the easiest way to visualize that is actually to look at the points themselves again. Now you'll see the, reflect, the points are now reflecting the actual colors. The most common use of this is obviously going to be uh, with the use of aerial imagery. Um, but you can be very creative in this process. You could apply colors from, for instance, a topographic map, or maybe it's a map that you scanned that reflects some of the data that you're working with, perhaps a pipeline map. Those pipeline uh, maps, whatever colors are associated with them, can then be as associated with your LiDAR point cloud. So again, you can be very creative in this process. Now at this stage, it's probably a, a, good, a good time to take a look at another visualization option with our point cloud. Uh, to this point, we've been looking at our point cloud from a top-down perspective. Um, we can now activate our 3D window. And 
Obviously, this is not a new component of Global Mapper, but it certainly takes on uh, a considerable amount of significance when we come to actually working with these three-dimensional point cloud data sets. Those of you who did not see our uh, What's New in Version 16 webinar, I think it was last month we did that, or the month before, I guess, we introduced the Skybox, which is this kind of realistic backdrop to our 3D view. Now we can see our point cloud as a 3D uh, uh, layer as a, each point obviously sp suspended in its uh, three-dimensional plane and obviously the skybox uh, indicating is a very sunny day behind the scenes so this is a great way to visualize your point cloud especially now that we've associated each point with the appropriate RGB it looks like a photorealistic model obviously whatever selection you make it's important to know what's being represented and that's very true when you choose uh, this option which I've bypassed which is classification. Classification is going to reflect what each point actually represents and this is perhaps one of the more important visualization options uh, from this list. In the case of uh, this particular point cloud we only have two classifications. We've got gray points and we've got brown points. In order to help us determine what those points are we're going to actually activate the legend and the legend is triggered by the over the um, map layout button, which is fourth button in the toolbar. And we're going to choose to display a legend based on our loaded vector types. Now we could customize the legend with whatever settings that we want in here, um, change its position, etc. I'm just going to go with the defaults and click OK, and you're going to find it's displayed right down here in the corner. And as you can see, confirming what I said previously, we have two types of uh, points in this uh, layer: ground points and unclassified points. Is it possible to change the color of the um, classes in this? You don't like my brown points? Is that what you're saying? Um, <laughs> I'm saying that the grass is usually it's sort of greenish, well, and it yeah. might be nice to have the grass good, a little good green. Good point. Point well taken. Yes, the answer to the question is absolutely you can. Obviously, the the initial association we try to make it as relevant as possible. Brown dirt, ground, gray, we don't really know what it is, so that's kind of left as an unclassified. But yeah, the colors can be assigned based on whatever uh, ever, whatever colors you want. And that's actually triggered in the configuration dialog box from my toolbar. These are points, so we're going to go under point styles, and if you scroll through this list of the currently available styles, you will encounter LiDAR, uh, ground shots, uh, unclassified, etc. And it's just a case of defining the colors uh, right down here at the bottom. You can you can make them whatever shape, whatever size you want. So the sky is the limit, quite literally, as far as the visibility is concerned. So yeah, that is certainly an option. Now um, we are going to talk a little bit more, uh, specifically with this data set, about the idea of this data being unclassified. And I think actually I may actually bring in a different data set for some of our scenarios as well. Um, obviously, whoever collected this. Uh, particular point cloud was mostly concerned with ground. That's why that's the only visible uh, classification. Buildings, trees, in other words, everything that's not a ground point, uh, it threw into the unclassified pile. And if I was intending to use this uh, LiDAR point cloud, for instance, for vegetation analysis, or perhaps for doing some building, building modeling, I would have to do some processing on this data. And that's what I'm going to introduce a little bit later, a very, very powerful tool that we now have access to that will identify where there are buildings and where there are trees, etc. We'll get to that just a little bit later. Before we get there, a couple of other things to show you by way of uh, some of the initial uh, visibility options. Um, this again, I have to stress, this is only available if you have uh, the LiDAR module. Um, the tool that I'm about to show you is in the standard version of Global Mapper, but it only will work with a point cloud if you have the module activated, and that is my profile tool. Right here in the toolbar, uh, 3D path profile, you can see the text hovering over my cursor. If I select that option, I can generate a cross-sectional view of my point cloud, um, looking at my data in, from a lateral perspective. Now, this, again, is not a new tool in Global Mapper. It's been, it has been available for many uh, generations. Essentially, a, it creates a cutaway view. In the context of this data, um, the fact that these are points, we need to do a little more with just uh, uh, the, the profiling tool rather than defining the profile as a line. Because obviously, if we drew a line through, the, through a certain area, it's very unlikely it actually would intersect a lot of points. So what we need to do is define a 
a buffer, if you like, within which the points will be displayed. So the first thing you can do when you activate this tool or when you're ready to create a profile view, and I'm gonna initiate this through a right click, just simply right click on the map, is I can specify the corridor within which uh, the points will appear. It brings up a dialog box, lets you put in a unit of measure, just for the sake of it, I'm gonna bring this down to about 25 meters. Now this is a buffer distance, so this is gonna be either side of the buffer or the um, profile line that I'm gonna create. And you'll see this in just a second, how this is manifest. So if I begin the process of creating a cross-sectional view, I'm simply using my left mouse button, and then when I'm done, I use my right mouse button. Now again, you'll notice I've created a line. That yellow object is the linear path of my profile. The pinkish area defines the extent within which the points will be displayed. So in other words, it's not just along the line, but either side of the line. And to finish the line, as with any digitizing function in Global Mapper, it's simply a right-click option. And as you'll see now, we're looking at that point cloud from the side, if you like. Cutaway view, lateral perspective, and the fact that our buffer area encompasses the full extent of the Capitol building in this case, we can obviously see that displayed nicely in this view. We're gonna come back and look at this in a different context a little bit later, but initially, for initial visibility, uh, it's a great tool, again, isolating the points in that uh, a, uh, vertical plane, if you like. A couple other things um, I want to look at while we have this point cloud visible. Um, looking at my notes, you know, obviously the visualization of the point cloud will help you to discern patterns in the data. We can see through the selection of classification, we can see that there are ground points and that there are unclassified points. But if we want a little more detail, if we want information about how many points, um, I mean, what's the distribution of points within my data? What we're going to talk about now are some of the analysis functions um, that we can apply to a point cloud. Um, if I select the point cloud layer in my overlay control center, um, I can click the metadata button. And the metadata uh, will list a number of uh, uh, characteristics for this file. Uh, the number of points, this is confirming what we saw in the overlay control center. The amount of memory that it's using, <laughs> point cloud memory. This is a very important one, the density of the points. And this is an averaged value. So it's just over two and a half points for every square meter. Uh, from this point cloud. The bounding boxes are also noted here in various formats and also the projection information is noted at the bottom. You'll notice as well we have min max elevation. We have a number of points here obviously that there must be some problem. They're implying these are below sea level. We'll address that in just a little bit. Um, but you can see a summary of the point cloud. Right next door to my metadata tab there's a statistics tab and this is extremely useful because this provides a more broad uh, analysis of the contents of this file. Uh, we talked about returns numbers. We can now do a, a quick uh, a cursory glance at, how, at which points are first uh, returns, which are second, first of many, etc., and the percentage breakdown of each. So obviously all returns are 100%. Those that are considered first, well, 86% of my points are first returns. Now obviously that leaves, uh, what, 14? My math right there, Taya? 14. <laughs> that uh, would be a second, third, or fourth. In other words, a second return. So again, it's just quick visual analysis of uh, those uh, percent breakdowns. Um, the attribute uh, um, values and min-max within each attribute is also noted here. Perhaps most useful and most important are the classifications that are associated with each point. If you look at the percentage breakdown, almost half of my points, actually over half of my points, I should say, are unclassified. Um, I see that as a problem in this case because uh, half of the points, half of those 870,000 points are completely useless in their current form and would n we would need to address that as far as uh, making the data more useful is concerned. So metadata will give you the information necessary to see what classes are available in your point cloud, to see the distribution of those. That will allow you then to perform the filters that we encountered first during the import process. We can now, if necessary, um, re, uh, readdress that in filtering process using another button which is in our LiDAR module toolbar. And again, we've got this, we have now have the same filtering options. Now that I know I have ground and unclassified points, I can simply disable all and perhaps enable my ground points or whatever combination of, of, of classes we want to display or we want to work with. So now we have that information where we feel better qualified, better informed to make those decisions. For the time being, we'll just keep all of those uh, all of those on. A couple of other options to look for, and options being the operative word, we're going to take a look at the options for a point cloud. Um, we can specify, uh, override the default visual characteristics, and specify for this particular layer um, a 
shading pattern if necessary. So that's over and above the uh, the module or uh, the toolbar setting we can specify for an individual layer. And this will be useful if you've got multiple point cloud layers in the overlay control center and you want to distinguish them in different ways. You have that option at the layer level. Redefine the units. Uh, meters is the default in this case. Um, we can alter our elevation values. We're getting into a little more of the editing capability, which I'm going to touch on, on next, but we can specify scale vector power or offset to adjust the point cloud uh, elevations themselves universally um, or filter the point cloud based on known constraints. So for instance, if I knew that my negative numbers are obviously incorrect, I can specify a cutoff in this case of zero, which will remove those that are negative. So we can define very precisely here the maximum and minimum values. I'll show you in a little bit how we can go into even more depth as far as those elevation filters are concerned. But at this level, a uh, very simple process just to define the extent. Those points that are not within the range that I define will be removed or they will be rendered uh, non-active. Any process I applied will not be applied to those points. Next tool I'm going to show you, again, not a new tool in Global Mapper, but it comes into, uh, it has a, a certain amount of significance when working with point clouds, and that's our search function. Um, triggered with the binoculars tool in the toolbar, if I click on the search dialog box, a um, couple of things that this, this will allow me to do. First of all, it will allow me to visualize the data, the point cloud data, in a tabular context. And you can see now all 870,000 points are now listed in a table view. We can also query at this stage, and I'm not actually going to do this right now in the interest of time, but it's fairly intuitive. Any of the available attributes, elevation perhaps being the most common, we can define and build a query based on whatever operator we want and whatever numeric value we want as well. Um, in that case, it would be a numeric value. Uh, so you can build queries, build a new search, and then within those results, create a further level of filtering. So the, the Search dialog box, a search or query function within Global Mapper certainly has its relevance when working with the tabular data uh, that's associated with our point cloud. I think perhaps even the, a more useful function in this uh, dialog box is simply the, uh, the ability to sort. I've selected the elevation column here, and because there's almost a million points, it might take a few seconds here to respond. But when it does and when it refreshes, I will have my point cloud ordered essentially in terms of elevation and confirming what I suspected there are a number of points here that are in negative territory um, I would be very confident in simply selecting my held down my shift button and using that delete selected at the bottom to remove those points so this is a manual visual QA process where we can go down the list and see uh, you know what's likely to be an erroneous point and physically remove that based on simply sorting in this case going to the other extreme again we can see the upper extent and again if there's a point there that's way beyond our expected level as far as this area is concerned very easy simply select it and delete it and at that stage I mean simply using global mapper for processing LiDAR in that way doing a little bit of filtering in this way you could quickly turn around and export those files uh, if that's your workflow importing last exporting glass is very very simple oh I should have also mentioned uh, I had a we had a conversation recently with somebody who actually had done this but that tabular view of the data also allows export basically you can copy a group of points if you want to filter the points based on a certain area certain uh, elevation range right click copy to clipboard and you can paste those into Excel if you want to generate a report and granted some of those uh, the length of the uh, the amount of points is going to be very large you might want to be careful working with that volume of data but it is possible to essentially export or capture that data in a tabular form and uh, have that as a report uh, or generate a, a spread sheet from that data. Another function that's activated only with the LiDAR module, and for this I'm actually going to select a group of points, is the ability to perform more manual filters. Again, based on what has been selected, we could have selected all of the points in the point cloud for this purpose as well, or you could constrain the selection to the extent of a geographic area. That's another option. But if I right click after some LiDAR points have been selected, and by the way, I should mention the fact that this is a red box is merely an indication that we have lots of little red outlines indicating lots of little points have been selected. In fact, you can see at the bottom of my, my uh, task, my uh, status bar, bottom of the screen, below my scale bar down here, 349 points selected within that area. But the tool I want to show you is actually under Advanced Selection Options. This is, again, only available if the module act is active in your setup of Global Mapper 16. Filter selected LiDAR points by, and you'll notice a number of options available in here. Um, again, based w uh, within our selected area, we can filter based on elevation range. And the if elevation range is noted here, represent the minimum and maximum within the extent of what was selected. 
Um, we can filter by color. We know there's RGBs now uh, associated with these points. So if we want to limit those to a particular color range, we can do that as well. Uh, and defining the fuzziness value, in other words, how close to the selected color do they need to be. Scan angle or classification once again. So I'm just going to, for the purpose of illustration, there's not a great deal of elevation range here, so I'll have to be very careful with what I do. But I'm going to change this minimum range from 38.14 to, let's say, 39. And hopefully the results of this, as you will see, will be a slightly smaller subset of my, my uh, data is now selected. Now again, all we're doing here is filtering the selection. We haven't actually removed the points that we don't need. We've just merely, a lot, merely used this for a filtered selection group. With points selected, there's a lot we can do with those now. We can edit them. Right click and edit. And all of those remaining points, we can assign whatever uh, classification we want to those points. We can apply an elevation if that's applicable. I'm not sure that that would necessarily be a good idea because you're overriding the default. Flag them with one of the available flags. Or we might just simply copy and paste them into a new layer if that's relevant. Control C, you can't see what I'm doing on my keyboard. Control C, Control V, and then I can paste them into a new layer, creating a subset of my overall point cloud based on the filters that I've applied. Okay. Um, next one's an interesting one as well. Again, we're, we're dealing with a little bit more of the analysis of our point cloud. Obviously, from a kind of a, a, a wide area perspective, it would appear that uh, my point cloud is fairly evenly distributed, except for the areas over here towards the water. This is actually the river. Um, but if I wanted to get an idea as to the level of clustering of my points, we have a tool in Global Mapper that will allow you to do this. And again, I should stress, this is not a new tool. This is a tool that we've actually demonstrated in different contexts. But with point clouds, it comes in, again, it has a, a relevance uh, for working with this data. And what I've done is open the Overlay Control Center. I've right-clicked on my uh, LiDAR layer, my um, uh, Augusta light our point cloud and you'll notice the option to create a density grid this is essentially a heat map tool it can be used with any data uh, points are, tip are more uh, typically the data format will be used um, if I select this option I'm just going to go with the default options here and what is happening is it's building a grid now I should stress while the status bar is moving along here this is not an elevation grid we're not defining uh, height values within our point cloud rather what we're doing is we're mapping the relative clustering of points within this point cloud the easiest way to see this more clearly is to turn off the original point cloud and what's left is a heat map indicating the number of points per square meter you'll see going from zero around the periphery um, up through one to about seven points per square meter. So this is a, a clustering or heat map. So we're getting a completely different perspective on our point cloud. Now you'll notice a heavy concentration of points within this area. If I turn on my point cloud again, difficult to see, but that actually corresponds, if we go a little closer, I think I need to use my zoom tool, with a very defined band through the middle. This is actually an overlap band between two flight lines. Um, so you'll see there actually is a heavier concentration that corresponds with that overlap, and we can see that very clearly here. Also, kind of a, a, a peak here, this actually corresponds with where there's vegetation. Again, we know that there's multiple returns from uh, uh, leaves, etc. So in this case, we have a heavier concentration where there is a combination of the overlap and vegetation. So another way of visualizing your data. Final thing I'm going to do as far as analysis is concerned, I'm just going to unload this data. Control U is our keyboard shortcut. I'm going to bring up another workspace, and this is a very small point cloud. This might represent, I don't know, a small area, perhaps a field, you know, a localized area. I'm going to change the classification to RGBs. Um, We've imported a point cloud. Um, the number, the variables that we uh, saw with this point cloud include, as we looked at the metadata, we can see the number of points, the average concentration of the points across the point cloud, uh, the bounding coordinates. What if you wanted to determine the precise area that's covered by our point cloud? This is another function that's not new in Global Mapper, but again, has applicability for working with LiDAR. Again, it's a right-click option in the Overlay Control Center, and B boxes or coverages is the option you're going to choose. And if I choose that, I have the option to choose a rectangular area, in other words, I'm MBR for this point cloud, or a polygon area, and I'm going to choose no. And I can also decide how coarse or how rough my, I'm going to uh, create uh, this feature. In other words, do I want it to cut the corners, or do I want to match precisely where each point is in the bounds of my point cloud? I'm going to keep it rough, which will give me a more precise measurement, and we'll click OK. Now, it's not initially visible, but if I turn off my point cloud, you'll now notice I have a bounding box that defines the 
interpolated extent of the point cloud. And if I use my feature info button and select this area feature that's been created, you'll notice I get all of the information pertaining to that uh, area, including the actual physical bounds. You'll see the, uh, no, the area in square meters because that's how my system is configured. It could be square feet if that's the case. So you can see very clearly how much area we now have covered by this little sample point cloud. I want to talk a little bit now about um, some of the editing functions. We've looked at the analysis. We've looked at how can we determine the characteristics of our point cloud visually. Um, how can we see how many points are in there, the distribution of points. I want to talk about editing the point cloud now. We've I kind of alluded to this just a little bit. I'm going to unload this data once again. I'm going to bring in the same file we were looking at previously. Again, this is derived from a workspace, so I'll just bring in the workspace file. Now, I showed you this very briefly in passing, but editing might begin at the individual point level. Select a point with my digitizer and right-click and edit, and you have the option to change the classification for that selected point. Now, the likelihood of you performing edits at the point level within your point cloud is pretty minimal. Be uh, a lot of points to try to... There, indeed, there were at 800. And so what are you doing for the rest of the afternoon, Tim? Maybe you should get busy doing some editing of That's your point how cloud. many points per second while I'm still here? I don't know. I don't know. That's going to keep you busy. But... Um, yeah, certainly doing it individual level, not very practical, but it is certainly doable. So more likely you're going to do this based on either a selected group of points or perhaps based on a query that you have run to filter out certain points. Again, bringing up my search dialog box, it's actually going to sh display all of the data, but we can then synchronize so our selection is um, cor correlates with what we've selected on the map. And then we can search within those selected features and perhaps delete, perhaps edit, whatever. Um, so again, selecting a point or more than one point in our search dialog box, again, brings up the same dialog box. So we have the ability at the point level or collective point level to make modifications to our point cloud. Um, what's probably more useful is the ability to perform more automated classification processes. And this is where we're really going to bring into place some of these advanced tools that are available in the toolbar. Um, I'm going to visualize my data by classification once again. And once again, we're going to focus in... If we zoom in a little closer, it'll become clearer. We're going to look at this overlap band here. Now, in the case of this particular uh, flight, this LiDAR flight, you'll see that these overlap points, there was um, a number of them were thrown into the unclassified uh, bin, if you like. In other words, they're not useful at all. We've got a lot of points that obviously represent ground. We've got some that represent uh, vegetation and buildings, but we're, we're not confident enough at this stage to know what they are. Global Mapper can apply um, a... A very uh, precise um, mathematical computation to determine which of these points are likely to be ground points. And I'm going to initiate that process right now simply by clicking the auto classify ground points button in my toolbar. Uh, and by the way, my data to begin with could have been entirely unclassified. I could have started with no ground points at all. Um, and Global Mapper would have identified patterns within your point cloud, planes, in other words, that represent uh, possible surface that are not elevated. Those would typically be buildings. And uh, based on that algorithm, would assume that those are points, are, are ground points, I'm sorry. But we'll go with what we have as far as ground points are concerned. Now, I'll go with the defaults here. We can basically define our sampling area and the offset from a known ground point that's likely to be another ground point. In other words, we're dealing with a three meter threshold within our defined area. Those points that are within, th po I'm sorry, point three meters, I'm sorry, point three meters, we're going to assume they're also uh, uh, ground points. You can be more precise by bringing this number down or be a little more general uh, or a little more coarse, I guess, uh, by uh, increasing this value. Simply clicking OK at this stage. Um, hopefully, we'll show you the results quite clearly on this example that I'm showing you. And again, I should stress that this could have been performed against a point cloud that was completely unclassified to begin with. So going through, analyzing all of our points, and because of our visualization, the, automat the colors automatically change. You'll notice it's retained quite a few still unclassified, but the vast majority of the points that were within this area, and indeed many of the points that were unclassified throughout the point cloud, are now identified as ground points. The buildings are still unclassified. We're going to address that in just a second, but uh, we now have a tool that will, again, I use the term apply intelligence. It will give your point cloud a lot more value by, be by allowing you to uh, generate more points reflecting ground in this case and if we were generate a ground generating a ground model from this we could filter out the unclassified leaving the ground points and because we now have a denser point cloud with ground points gives us a much more precise ground model 
I want to change to another point cloud. And we're going to take a little trip down the road from where we are right now. I'm going to load up another workspace. This is just down the road in Portland. Um, another fairly small point cloud in this case. We're about 1.6 million. And again, in this case, we have uh, non ground, uh, all, all, all points are unclassified, confirmed by my legend at the bottom of the screen. Now, in this case, we need to do a little uh, processing uh, to get some intelligence in our data. I'm going to run the auto classify ground once again in this case. Uh, we've done it before. We're just going to quickly go through that. Again, knowing that we don't have any pre existing ground points, we're first going to identify through that. Uh, procedure we followed before, which of these points are likely to be ground. It will render them as brown points, or if Taya had her way, they would probably be green points. Um, but uh, we'll keep them as brown for the time being. And based on what's left over, we're going to apply another automated reclassification process. So you can see its status bar is removing our non ground points first, and eventually it will hopefully render. The new points on the map again going through and analyzing each of these as they go through so i don't know i see any other questions coming through here while we're waiting for our status bar uh, good source somebody's asking about sources of data i think we've covered that one um okay here we go we've got our got our point cloud um so what we did again same as we've done in our previous example basically identify where there are likely to be ground points um You'll notice very distinct rectangular features here. It um, doesn't take a rocket scientist to identify these are likely going to be buildings. These are large warehouse style buildings. Next tool, what we're going to show you here is an auto classify, auto classify non ground points. That's like a tongue twister. Auto classify non ground points. Essentially, it's going to do what we did with our ground points, except look for patterns that define what's likely to be a building. Now, these are typically going to be elevated, and we can define the elevation. In other words, how high above a known ground surface do these need to be to be considered non ground, if you like. Um, again, how, how close. Uh, do we want to analyze based either on points to basings or meters? In other words, what level of, of resolution do we want as far as this analysis is concerned? Um, the offset distance on a given plane, buildings would typically be a relatively flat surface, whether a horizontal surface or inclined. Uh, we can do an analysis or we can perform this analysis based on threshold values, uh, defining the distance off that plane surface, if you like. So we can perform certain filters here, or, uh, apply certain settings. I'm just going to go with these defaults as they are. And what we're going to do as a result of this is reassign some of these unclassified points to be buildings. Hopefully this will work. And also analyze vegetation. A vegetation would typically be elevated points that don't follow a single plane but are offset. Obviously leaves do not exist on a single plane. A given tree has leaves uh, you know, obviously all over the tree. So that uh, is going to be analyzed as well. And those patterns are going to be used to determine what's likely to be a vegetation point. We'll go ahead and click that. Again, it's going to go through uh, various status bars here and hopefully give us the results that we need. Got another question coming in. Um, can we take these points now that they've been classified and create 3D vector features from Ooh, them? You, somebody's been listening to my, somebody listened to my bullets. Yeah, we're actually going to do that. Um, as you can see with the results of this process, we have reassigned certain points to uh, be more appropriately classified. And there was no manual input there. This was an automated process. Um, you'll see vegetation, these green points, high vegetation. Um, the threshold value, if you recall, was two meters. So we've only identified those vegetation points that are likely to be trees over, the, over two meters tall. So we're not dealing with you know, ground vegetation in this case. And the buildings very well defined here. You can see these um, are flat surfaces elevated from the surrounding ground, identified as buildings. It is not a perfect science. You will notice anomalies. I know one for a fact in this case right here. I don't know if you're noticing where my cursor is positioned. This is a, a highway bridge. There's a highway and there's a bridge and there's no, another road underneath. Well, Global Mapper looked at that as an elevated horizontal uh, plane, if you like, and thought it was a building. We could manually change those. Obviously, we can manually override some of those anomalies. Similarly, this very large building was so large, Global Mapper saw it as a ground surface in and of itself. Again, we can use that cross-sectional profiling tool I showed you previously and edit that. We can just draw a cross-section. I'm not going to encompass the whole building here. We'll just do a small section and simply select all of these points in this window and redefine them collectively. Again, this is not going to be a complete. I didn't extend the uh, path enough, but you can see very easy for me to do that if I define the width a little more precisely and reclassify those in a manual way. So the initial reclassification, obviously, it does a very good job of identifying where the likely buildings, but you can also use some of the manual tools to, uh, to clean up the process, if you like. 
So what we've done, manually editing points, reassigning points based on a selection process or perhaps based on a query. Um, identifying ground points, very, very simple process. Um, and then identifying non-ground points, in this case, buildings and vegetation. So there's a number of very, very, very powerful editing tools that are available to you within Global Mapper and the reclassification tools specifically within the module. The final section of my uh, the process to the uh, workflow today is to derive uh, meaningful data from my point cloud. And this is going to give us an ability to essentially vectorize some of these uh, uh, features or, or perhaps to generate a surface. And we're going to do that very quickly in just a minute. Let's look first while we have this layer on our screen at the, um, the buildings. The final button we have not addressed in the uh, LiDAR module toolbar is the ability to extract vector features. And if I go ahead and click that button, um, there are two sections here. Well, one in which allows us to um, outline buildings and one which allows us to extract tree points. Now, tree points will be defined as a clustering of, of LiDAR points um, that follow a specific pattern um, in terms of their arrangement that Global Mapper will identify as an individual tree. And you'll see there's a lot of information that can be garnered from that tree. We can also, if necessary, uh, approximate the coverage area for each tree. In other words, draw a little polygon. Um, that is an option. It does create kind of a messy map, to be honest, because you're going to get every tree outlined. And obviously, if there's overlap, so those polygons will be overlapped as well. So I'm not going to do that right now in this case, but it's another option that's available. So again, two different procedures happening concurrently here. And as a result of this, we're actually going to generate two new layers in our overlay control center. And we'll go ahead and turn off the point cloud when this, this uh, finishes so we can see a little more clearly what we generated here. Um, let's first of all look at the trees. This, this is fun. And this, I should mention, is a work in progress. There are uh, technicians as we speak that are developing uh, the next generation of this function, which is actually going to allow us to model these trees in 3D themselves. Right now, they're simply points. But with these points, we can select each one individually, and we can identify the characteristics of each tree. The elevation represents the elevation above sea level. The height value is the height above known ground. So we can see that's a 10 meter tree. And we have average spread and maximum spread as well. In other words, this tells us the size of the tree. And now uh, foresters and uh, arborists will tell you this information is extremely useful. The ability now to, to query this and to search this data, I'm going to bring up my search dialog box again. We can once again run a search on the uh, uh, the height value and you can see I'm just uh, running a sort in this case obviously we, we had our cutoff threshold at four meters so that's a minimum value of our height but we can go right up to the other extent and look at the highest tree in this area is 33 meters if we wanted to quickly find out where the the tallest trees were I'm gonna manually select these just so we can see the results you see a few down here in the corner are selected so very quick and very easy way to analyze where the likely uh, highest vegetation areas are the other layer we generated was our building layer. Now this is a three-dimensional layer. Again, this is a work in progress. We're working at fine-tuning this so that we um, enforce uh, rectangular buildings, perhaps. Um, you know, you can see this one is a fairly well-defined building. In fact, if we look at it in 3D, you can see it's actually a, a three-dimensional structure. So we actually generated a three-dimensional building footprint. Again, the elevation is defined in here, precise elevation, uh, uh, sorry, elevation above sea level and the precise height of that building as well is also noted. So very, very powerful tool for doing uh, uh, feature extraction uh, from what essentially began just a few minutes ago as an unclassified, um, unintelligent, uh, uh, three-dimensional point cloud, X, Y, and Z file. We were able to identify through these algorithms uh, where they were likely to be buildings. Now the final process, once again, unloading this map. Again, we're talking about getting intelligent data or getting useful data from a point cloud. Final workspace I'm going to load up is actually a very simple pre-filtered area of ground points. You can see my legend now implying there's only ground points here. I did this by way of preparation. I filtered out the uh, non-ground points, I left just ground points. Um, as I mentioned at the start of my presentation, um, LiDAR, more often than not, is a means to an end rather than an end in of itself. And very often, the end is a terrain model. Here we have our X, Y, and Z point cloud. I'll actually change back to looking at this by elevation. I want to generate a surface now. Very simple process in Global Mapper. From the analysis menu, create elevation grid from 3D vector data. When I go through this procedure, um, there are a couple of options I can uh, choose in terms of how that surface is created. Triangulation is the default. This will go through a process of creating a tin 
essentially a series of, of, uh, of triangles uh, connecting each one of the points, generating a surface from that. But with the availability of the module, the global, the um, LiDAR module, you can also run through a binning process. Binning allows you to generate a DTM, digital terrain model, which takes the minimum value within a defined area, or a DSM, digital surface model, which is the maximum value within a defined area. So two different variations, or the average is another one as well. So binning is going to take a lot uh, less time to process, give you a much smoother model at the end, and obviously let you define whether it's a DTM or DSM. I'll use the triangulation method in, method in this case. Simply click OK. So we can see the end result. It's creating a triangulated model for all of, from all of the points in this point cloud sample. Again, we'll open the overlay control center, turn off our LiDAR point cloud, and you'll see now we have a very precise, accurate surface model. And I'll just zoom in just a little closer here. I know we're running out of time very quickly here. Appreciate your patience today. And go into 3D. Now, this is just a precursor for where we're going next week because we're going to talk in a lot more detail about what we can do with these terrain surfaces. We're going to talk about volume calculation, uh, contour generation, which I'd hope to get to today, but unfortunately time is not on our side. Um, some of the other analysis tools like watershed analysis and viewshed analysis. But the raw material for, for all of those processes is a terrain surface, and we were able to generate a very precise and accurate terrain surface from our LiDAR point cloud. Final thing to talk about. I keep saying it's the final thing, but I promise this is the final thing. Um, I, again, at the start of my presentation, I talked about the two bookends. One is importing data. The other bookend is exporting. Um, let's assume we had performed certain edits to our data, perhaps reclassified it or applied classifications that were more appropriate. Um, getting point cloud data out of Global Mapper is as simple as getting it in from the file menu, export, vector, LiDAR format. We even added LiDAR as a subset of our vector data. Um, the supported formats include the standard LAS, which is the standard point cloud LiDAR format, but we also support the LAZ, the zipped, the compressed version of LiDAR as well. Both of those file formats can be imported. Both of those file formats can be exported. So what we're going to get from this process is simply uh, a series of points based on the points that are there already. So it's import, export of point cloud data. Um, again, I'm not going to go through with it, but it's simply a case of kicking OK and your export will be uh, your uh, exported file will be generated the other thing that we can do is we can take a terrain surface if your raw material is a raster surface model such as we have on the screen right now we can actually export that as a last file as well now in this case we're exporting our elevation grid format data so we select that from the export uh, submenu and once again, even though this is typically used to generate things like a DEM file or some sort of grid file, in this case we can also generate a LAS or LAS file. Because LAS or LAS are vector point files, uh, one of the things that we need to decide during this export is the spacing of the grid. It's going to generate a regular array of points based on whatever spacing that you assign here. And obviously, it's going to reflect the uh, elevation of the original model. So if somebody provides you with a, a one meter resolution um, uh, DEM, for instance, uh, you can generate a one meter point cloud. Obviously, the more the more precise, the uh, or more high resolution the original data, the better the potential quality of your point cloud. Um, there's little point in actually increasing this beyond the values that you're seeing here because this will just interpolate and add additional points where perhaps they're not necessary. But you again can uh, can generate a last file from a raster surface model. So, importing exporting and all the stuff in between all the processing certainly part of the global mapper package now all right looks like we're about out of time hopefully we've been able to get to most of the questions um we got to today i've seen people answering fast and furious while david's been talking here um, if not we'll follow up as soon as we can on your screen you'll also see the support email address that you can use if you have any burning questions that you haven't ans asked yet or you need um want to ask one of our technicians after yeah and also the global map forum i mentioned before here we have the url for the forum i didn't remember to point out in the help menu it's also listed in there um and as tan mentioned at the start we've hit the record button on this at the start oh, we did remember to record it didn't we Tan? i hope we did uh, i really hope so <laughs> so the record button has been hit so we, this will be processed hopefully within the next couple of days it will be posted to our website and if you're new to global mapper um and obviously we've been dealing very specifically with lidar today if you want a little more context if you like um it will be added to the ever increasing list of other webinars some of which are very basic introduction to some of the, the uh, uh, basic functions of the software some more detailed webinars but yeah uh, again, from the help menu, you can actually see a, a link to pre-recorded webinars.
webinars. This will be added to the list, but feel free while you're there to look at some of the others. You can also download the files, I believe, so if you want to look at those files locally, maybe store them locally on, on uh, in your network. If you uh, have other folks in your company using Global Mapper, you can use those as your own uh, informational library. So. Thank you for attending today. Thank you for your patience. I'm, apologies we overshot our time just a little bit. And Taya, thank you very much for your help and keeping those questions coming. You're welcome, and thank you, David. And thank you all for attending. We'll look forward to speaking with you next month at next month's webinar, which is 3D analysis. We're looking forward to that one. Thank you, everyone.